Hi. We're we live. <laughs> Hi. Now it's both of us. Okay. I'm Lynetta Linda, and we're here to talk about my book, Math and Magical, with Graham, the editor and producer. Welcome. Okay. So, so this take it away. chapter, this episode is episode eight. Yeah. of Reflections on the Journey, and this is chapter 14 of Math and Magical, and this is foundational keys. So the keys yeah. are what Math and Magical is really all about. This is a totally. builds all the way to this. Totally. This was our favorite part, too. This was the part when we were working on the book that we enjoyed the most. Graham was with me for every step of the way, as opposed to a normal book. This book was channeled, so Graham was present for every little bit of it. So this is a part of why he's so aware of what's going on. I think he knows the book by heart. So many of us were a bit concerned for him because he was wandering around, you know, saying it over and over again. Yeah. He knew the words. I feel this is odd for me because I normally have headphones on. We switched the gear up a bit. Hopefully you guys yeah. can hear us. Oh, we got these new little little wireless microphones, but I'm used to those big microphones in my headphones. So yeah. I feel naked without <laughs> I don't. I like this. It's better than having this thing in my face. I don't mind. I don't uh, mind. So welcome, everyone. Thanks Hi. for joining us. Uh, we got lots of people from around, around the world, New Zealand. I saw Tucson, Arizona, United Kingdom, uh, lots of people from the US of A. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. This is Reflections on the Journey. If you haven't already subscribed, thank you for those who have already subscribed. But yes. If you haven't, there's a subscribe button. It's a red one. It's probably down here somewhere below the video. And click that button. And there's a, a like button as well. If you click yeah, that, yeah. that helps the video out as well, helps the channel. So if you could do that, thank you so much. And and to give you, um, a f uh, we've talked about, or I've talked about doing um, Penthouse, the Penthouse Perspective, which is going to be the next show. So you will be made aware of that if you subscribe as well. It'll be on this channel. And we're going to be <clears throat> continuing to give away further copies of Mathematical on the Penthouse Perspective as well. So those of you whose names aren't being drawn now, they're all staying in the hat. <laughs> and we're going to just keep on drawing keep, keep and giving away names. more copies. Yeah. Okay. Right. So uh, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this is the show where we break down chapters of Math and Magical. We're on foundational keys. So foundational keys um, are, in our last episode, we talked about getting out of traps. When yep. you get stuck in traps, how do we get out? Well, that's the keys. Yep. So the foundational keys. So we got lots of your questions that you guys have written into us on mathematical.com. I, I have written them out here on my, my notes. I printed them out. I haven't written them out. Can't read his handwriting. <laughs> but uh, we'll answer some of those. And I have some of my questions that I'll be asking Lynette as well. So um, everything builds to these keys. And you begin this chapter by talking about these keys are not intellectual and they're not physical. You say they're vibrational. But yeah, this is really, really important, especially for a lot of people out there that are seeking, okay? And, um, and so many of us are. And if you're watching this show, then you're definitely a seeker. We want to understand that society, mainstream society, or what I call the matrix, has taught many of us, and we believe, that the keys to the kingdom, so to speak, the keys to mastering life, to mastering energy and emotion, are physical or intellectual, and they're not. And this is one of the biggest traps, and this is what foundational keys is really about. Understanding that the keys are not physical, they're not intellectual, they're vibratory. And this is why it's so crucial to make that mathematical connection, the connection between the heart and the intellectual mind and to teach them to work together. And these keys are designed to get us out of the traps. These keys, when we start to implement them in our daily lives, you'll find you can carry them with you wherever you go. One of my favorite expressions is you're born buck naked with everything you need mm. because the keys are vibratory. They're inside and you can access them through free will. So that's so, but why is it important to understand that they're vibrational versus like something you read in a book and you memorize and then you get, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not something you can memorize. Well, and no, and, and, and it is something that you have to practice and come yeah. to and come to become more, you know, become more adept at. I'm tripping over my words today. Uh, the reason that I want people to understand that they're vibratory is essentially because they are. And it can stop a lot of us from going down rabbit holes or on wild goose chases, thinking that by reading an intellectual book that you're going to get the answers from there. You certainly can get some tools and some really mm -hmm. great information. But ultimately, the keys are about practicing it in our day to day lives. And our divine creator has not left us without a life raft. So this is why I say we're all born buck naked with everything we need, because the keys are inside of us. And the name of the game 
is to recognize that the keys are inside of us, especially now with the challenges that we're facing. It is mm. crucial that we come to know this. So no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you will have access to these keys if you choose with your free will to access them. Mm. So I these are my favorite chapters, the keys. This is like, for me, it's the cherry on top of the cake. It's my saving grace. And these are what I have discovered have enabled me to come as far as I have in this experience so far, because I'm going to continue to master the keys. Sometimes I nail it. Sometimes I don't. But it doesn't matter. You can't climb a ladder from the top rung first. Just keep going. Just keep practicing. Just keep working at it. And familiarizing ourselves with the keys and understanding how they work, I think, is like half the journey, mm -hmm. half the battle. And so let's jump into the first, uh, the first key is that you say only ego can be offended. Wow, this is a really good one. This is so true. So this will speak to projections, resentments, taking offense, all of these kinds of things. When we start to understand that when any one of us is acting in a way that's unkind or painful, we're in our ego state, okay? And I like to use the acronym EGO, E-G-O for edge God out. And God for me is good orderly direction. So when we understand that ego is the only part of us that can be offended, we can start to choose whether or not to take offense by something that someone says. In, in my kitchen, I've got a little sign and some of my closest friends have got this sign too. It says, out of my mind, back in five minutes. Remember that one? Yeah, 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 okay, that. hopefully back in five minutes. So when somebody's got into a state of being unkind, cruel, selfish, any negative side of the spectrum, it's so helpful to practice this key and recognize that we're essentially out of our minds in that moment. We're mm -hmm. coming purely from the egoic perspective and not to take it too seriously. I know myself, as soon as I feel myself uh, feeling hurt or resentful, it immediately tells me that my experience is being perceived from my ego state, not from that of spirit or the connection of math and magic, the mind and the heart. When I start to recognize that somebody else is acting in a really unkind and cruel way and I remember this key, it enables me to disengage and then we don't polarize. I don't take offense. I don't form a resentment and I'm able to practice my boundaries and let go. So we're yeah. encapsulating a lot of information. It's, in it's a, a small... lot, but it's good stuff. But what I, what I wanted to kind of sh share with people or get to the root of is in that moment when you know, you're trying to understand this key and you're trying to get it implemented in your life, let's say you are offended, what what are the steps that you go through to kind of go, okay, I remember the foundational key, the first one, which is only the ego can be offended. Yep. How do you get from there to being offended, to being released out of that trap? I'm, I'm reminded of one of the things that the Bible tells us that Jesus the Christ had once said, and he said, forgive them, they know not what they do. So the first step is not to form resistance, is to go, okay, and, and this speaks to one of the tips and tools that I give that I call, bah. B-A-A-A, -A -A, which is breathe, just breathe, and then accept and allow what is happening, and then ask for help. So in the initial moment, when, when we're either going into that fearful, painful place ourselves, or when somebody else has gone into that place and they're projecting it onto us, there's a nanosecond of time where we have a choice to grab that bait, take offense, and form polarization and resist, or to take that breath and go, okay, I'm recognizing that this person or myself is acting in a painful, hurtful way, which is mm -hmm. creating separation from the heart. And in that nanosecond, you have a choice. And it's going to take practice to start to spot the nanosecond. And before we can spot that nanosecond, we need to understand initially the concept that says, which you become to live, that says, I don't need to take offense. I can remember that I or my, myself or the other party is technically out of their mind. That doesn't mean disrespect them or, uh, you know, disregard, deny or any of these things. It just means don't take the bait. Don't become engaged. Let it go. Breathe and start to practice balancing yourself. Now, from that hmm. balanced perspective, that breath, we become internally powered, not externally driven. So if we're taking the bait, either our own, because we've gone into the ego reactionary state or the other party, you've essentially taken the bait. And now you're going to go down that rod or slide and you may not enjoy the ride. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So it, it's like you get, 
offended or you get triggered or whatever. And it's we just, choose to consciously or unconsciously. So, we yeah, have to happens, choose. Yeah. We, we have to choose to take a break. And so it's just like taking a break and just mm -hmm. creating a bit of distance. So you can be like, Oh yeah. Just that nanosecond of space, just yeah. that nanosecond of space. And I also want to just throw in something about meditation here. Okay. Scientists did, did uh, discoveries on the human brain. And what they found was that in the frontal lobe, which is where we react when somebody had a lobotomy back in days when they were incredibly unkind practices on humans, they would remove the frontal lobe. And from this place of a removed frontal lobe, somebody was not reactionary. They wouldn't get angry. Okay. So when we meditate, what actually physically happens in the brain over time is that <clears throat> the frontal lobe obviously doesn't become removed, but what it does is it actually creates a physical space in the brain that gives us a little bit more time. So the mm -hmm. more we practice, you know, staying present in that moment of the trigger, the better we're going to get at this over time. I know myself, my reactionary state, you know, uh, especially when I was a much younger person would have been whew, like, you know, that thing was on fire before they even said anything. And now it's like, Hmm, I can sit here and go, wow, isn't that interesting? Mm. They've lost their mind and I can either lose my mind and join them, or I can begin to practice that breath, which will automatically restore balance within me. And if you've also been practicing meditation along with it, you'll find that meditation essentially meets you in that moment so that you don't go down the reactionary path. Because if we both go down that path, myself and the other party, we're lost. And then we got the blind leading the blind. Mm -hmm. So this is where mm -hmm. I love Rumi's quote. He says, we're all just really walking each other home. So by practicing that nanosecond, working on the breath, don't worry, the universe will take you to the next step. Divine grace never takes you anywhere that it can't guide you and protect you. So just practicing that first step and you'll find you'll get better and better and faster and faster. And you'll get to a point where you can start to see it coming. You can start to feel them coming. I know that you've mm -hmm. started to experience mm -hmm. this in terms of, you know, when that mathematical connection is made, we start to be able to see intuitively so much more clearly. Hmm. I love okay. it. Let's give away um, a copy of the book. Copy of the book. People have, uh, for those of you who haven't won yet or aren't sure what we're about to do, we're about to draw a name and give away a free copy of Mathematical. Um, so if you want a chance to win, you go on mathematical.com, scroll to the bottom of the website, and you can enter your name to win there. Yes, and I will be continuing to give away copies of this on the penthouse perspective. I pull you, read. Marie Gormley. Marie Gormley? I hope Marie I'm Gormley. pronouncing your name correctly. You've won a copy of Mathematical, and Yay. Sally will send you your free copy. Congratulations. Right. I think we should also say something for people about uh, when they're struggling with downloading or any of the issues, that you can talk to Supercast. Oh, yeah. For, Sally has said she's getting quite a few emails from people that okay. aren't quite sure. So you could speak to that much. Yeah. More, so um, if you're if you're having trouble with uh, downloading Mathematical or any sort mm -hmm. of technical issues, um, send an email to hello at supercast.com. Okay. Sally can give you that information as well. Uh, and then they have specific people to help you exactly with your any technical issues you might have. Yes. So. OK, great. Um, okay, so let's jump on to uh, number two of the foundational keys, which is success and failure don't actually exist. So my question to Lynette is, how can we fully play the game of life if we aren't aiming to succeed? Well, it's a false belief system that we've been taught to buy into. And as many of you know, false belief systems lead to suffering. So we want to look at this experience that we're having um, from the perspective of what we're really meant to be doing here, as opposed to what we're being programmed to believe we're here to do. We are here to master energy and emotion. And in the physical reality that we're living in, we call the 3D reality where we've got the meat suit temple, we experience duality. Okay, in our natural state as energetic beings, we cannot experience duality. There just is. We just are. It's just love. That's all there is. We come into this physical reality to master energy and emotion. And one of the ways that our creator has, you know, built the classroom for us, so to speak, is with duality. So concepts that create polarization like good and bad and right and wrong and success and failure are actually not true. So success and failure only exist for people who buy into polarity, for people who buy into duality. We're not here to be successful or to fail. You can't fail. You, you literally cannot fail. You may need to come back and learn your lessons again and again, and that's fine, no problem. But you can't actually fail because it doesn't exist. But if you buy into it, 
the first law of the universe is like attracts like. So if you buy into the concept of success and failure, then you're definitely going to experience it. We want to move from success and failure, which creates polarization, just like good and bad and right and wrong. It creates separation. Okay. We want to move towards something that looks a little bit more like, are you having a good time? Are you feeling inspired from the heart? Are you feeling creative and expansive? Now, in order to move towards that, we're also going to have to let go of false belief systems like comparing and competing. We're each our own unique work of art. Nobody sees Picasso or Monet or any of the great artists apologizing for their own unique work of art or calling themselves a success or failure. They would simply say, I was inspired to create this piece or I was not. So in order to move from success and failure, good, bad, right, wrong, those polarized states, we need to step into our sovereignty. We need to recognize that each one of us is a unique work of art and you can't fail. Now, you may have experiences that you don't enjoy and that you don't want to repeat, but that's about using the keys and mastering the game. So if we're going to call it success in that sense, success would be recognizing who and what you really are. And from that place, you live free and independent of the good opinion of others. You're no longer living your life from an externally driven place. You're living from an internally powered place, which enables you to go as far as you're willing and wanting to go to mm. expand beyond. How many times, Graham, have you decided to let go of how you were being defined by the external system and moving towards what you felt inspired to do through the heart? Remember, inspire. The word inspire comes from Latin origin, in spiritus, to be in spirit. So when we're in spirit and we're inspired, there's no limits. There's no good, no bad, no right, no wrong, no success, no failure, and a lot of freedom. But there's also, you said it, you're moving towards what feels good. Yes. But, yes. but you're also saying that good and bad don't exist. So, so rectify so we're that using Right. So we're using the word good in the sense of what feels positive in my body, what feels relieving. So even if you're taking a tiny step forward, you may not be able to take a big leap and completely alleviate any of the negative experiences or the, the challenge you could say in the body, the unpleasantness. In order to move away from that, sometimes we need to take baby steps. And that is what we would classify as good or bad, positive or negative. We just want to make sure that we don't polarize. We're here to master energy and emotion and therefore stepping into a positive state or what we would also call good. So I want to be careful we don't use more polarizing language. So it'll be, does this feel better? Does this bring relief? Even if only a little bit. Baby steps sometimes, you know, we have to begin at the beginning. Does that answer your question? I think so. I think what I'm getting is that when we judge uh, a, an outcome as being good or bad, like it's like, when we judge it as mm -hmm. opposed to it being, this feels good and that's okay. Whether, you know, it's just kind of like an, an acceptance of what is. Yes. When we accept what it is, that's as opposed right. to judging it, that's we the good or bad. We won't polarize, yeah. we won't create separation. So we could call this rolling forward the silver carpet or finding the silver lining. So over the past couple of months, I've had incredibly challenging experiences on many fronts in my in my story, as we all are experiencing right now. I don't think there's a single human mm -hmm. on the planet that isn't experiencing challenges. I'm so very grateful that I've got the keys because I've been given some very difficult information to hear from the ego's perspective. And I immediately apply the keys and I spin it as soon as I can to find the positive because there really is no positive and negative. It's just what's the next step forward? What do I need to do to move forward here and adjust my course? Okay. So for example, um, I lost a loved one they passed over and they're no longer in the physical. And I can either stay in that polarized state and say that the fact that they've left is a negative and painful experience, or I can roll the silver carpet forward and recognize that all of us have to leave at some point. And thankfully, because I have physically died while I was in this body, I, I know firsthand where that loved one is gone. And I'm going to apply that to my silver carpet. And I'm going to remind myself that this person has moved on to the next stage in their evolution. And that is not a bad thing. I will miss them. I will grieve them. And I'll never forget them. But it doesn't have to be a bad or a wrong thing when we mm. come to understand and appreciate what life is really about. 
Okay, so it's about finding the silver lining and adjusting your course, constantly adjusting your course as you go forward facing these challenges and accepting life on its terms. And this is a big part of what Mathemagical is about, understanding what life is really about, not what we've been programmed to believe. When we begin to go inward, when we go inside through this, this spirit connection, intuition, in spirit, meditation, you start to just know you don't think or believe, you can feel it and you just know. And then the next beautiful part is about something like losing a loved one that's leaving the physical reality is that remembering who and what we really are, that spirit connection is always there. And I have regular connections with people that have left the physical reality in spirit state, in my dream state and through telepathy. Nobody ever dies, not really. They just leave the physical container. So find the silver lining. Move forward, constantly adjusting your course, understanding that there is no good, no bad, no right, no wrong, no success or failure, just the next step in your own evolution. Mm. So if I can fractal into this a bit, when we're accepting life just as it is, mm -hmm. um, this doesn't obviously mean that we accept uh, things that need to be you know, stopped, you know, abusive behavior. Oh, no, 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 no. So no. we accept no, no, no. that the behavior is happening, right. but we don't, we don't condone it, right? Like there's no, a difference. No, and that's a lot of where, people confuse those. No, and that's where boundaries come in. And this is where uh, a number of you are working with me. I've used an expression, kindness with no truth. So those of us that want to stay in our hearts and be loving, sometimes we can feel really frustrating or frustrated when a situation presents itself that would, you know, cause us to feel like, I have to become a bully in order to do something about this, mm. or uh, I have to behave in some way that doesn't feel good or positive to me, that doesn't bring relief and expansion. We want to understand that when I'm saying accepting life on its terms, it doesn't mean that you'll tolerate abuse of any kind. That is where we want to begin to practice boundaries. And, and letting that person know, or in that situation, creating the next step to be the safer place to move forward to. So this doesn't mean, you know, lay down and take it, yeah. not, not by any means at all. And that's where we incorporate our spiritual warrior. And we start to use tools that will not create further resistance and friction. We start to use the keys that will enable us to transmute the situation. I've dealt with lots of bullies in my lifetime, and I've experienced being a bully myself. And this is also a, a place where we go back to and remember that when somebody's behaving in these ways, they really are not conscious. They don't know what they're doing. Don't tolerate it. Create a healthy boundary. That would be your next step. But don't resist them either. Accept what they're doing and create safe space in whatever way that you need to for each particular circumstance. Does mm. that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I think it was just important to also differentiate. To yeah. Very much, very um, much, yes. And again, you know, I'm going to be continuing with the Pentel's perspective because these subjects are so vast. vast. I mean, how many hours have we spent talking, Graham? Yeah. So many hours talking about this stuff, you know, we can go deeper and deeper. And I really want to really want to stress this point, please. Understanding that you just need to take the next step. Spirit will guide you. This is why meditation is such a very, very powerful tool, because spirit will take you the next way. It'll take you the next to the next step, to the next piece. Mm -hmm. Just surrender to that, mm -hmm. knowing that you are constantly being guided, watched over and protected. No exceptions. Awesome. So we have we have a, uh, eight keys in the um, the foundational key chapter. Um, we're going to get through as many of them as we can. We have some really good questions. But we have today some really good too. questions too. So uh, for those of you, I think he's telling me to be. <laughs> well, it's good though. We're diving into this and we're yeah. getting into it, and that's yeah. what I think is important. But I'm just letting everyone know that mm -hmm. we may not get through all the keys. So to get the full. Uh, chapter and the information it's it's going to be in the book so we're not going to cover yeah. all the keys probably today mm -hmm. uh but we're going to go to the third key uh where you talk about worry and it being self-sabotage and we need to we need to switch from progressive concern to worry so how does one break that cycle when you're in that worry state when you're when you're just lost in it and how do you okay. switch so first of all, we want to recognize the first law of the universe, which is like attracts like in every way. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. I'm not referring to it the way we've been programmed as the law of attraction and the law of abundance, because that tends to cause us to think externally. Like attracts like means in every way, your thoughts, your beliefs, your choices, every single way 
Okay. So if you're worrying about someone, you're actually what doing what I call awfulizing. Oh no. Oh no. And there's fear attached to worry. We don't want to do that. If we've mm. got a loved one or ourselves facing a challenging situation, we do not want to add fear to that. And then we want to also remember that life is about challenge and overcoming it. And this is a really, really difficult key to master for some of us because We've also been socially conditioned to believe that if we worry about someone, it means that we love them. Mm. And I would have to say, Interesting. as a mother of two, I do not worry about my children. And this is one of the keys that I learned becoming a parent. I switched to progressive concern because I did not want my fear, my inadequacies or my lack of personal awareness to contribute to the challenges that my dearest were experiencing. So mm. we switch it to progressive concern, which means accepting life on its terms, accepting that challenges come and that this person or ourselves can get through this. And of course we will. Mm. So we take the next step. And sometimes that means just breathing, okay? Breathing and letting go of the concept of worry because like attracts like, and embracing instead a more proactive perspective, which is, okay, being active, it's very, it's a very active process to let go of worry when it grips our body, okay, yeah. that fear just, <gasps> especially, you know, life and death stuff, and I've experienced so many things, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not being flippant in any way, I understand what I'm asking you to do here. To switch to progressive concern immediately aligns us with the solution, okay, it gets rid of the fear, and we can take action, even if it's just to breathe that fear through the body to release it. This is a very active thing mm. to do. And worry sort of says to us, let's get busy. Let's do something to protect our loved one. Absolutely, yes. Take whatever action is appropriate with healthy boundaries. And the first one can be, no, I'm not going to take the bait. I'm not going to accept this worry. I'm going to accept that a challenge has presented itself and I'm going to take whatever action is necessary. Take that next step. Whatever situation is presenting itself, you'll see from that calm, internally powered state, you'll see the next step. You'll know. Mm. And it might be call 911, but remain in the calm state while you can. I recently had an experience with someone who was deeply traumatized and this person was... Um, screaming and crying. And I understand where they were coming from because one of their loved ones was experiencing some pain. I understand that. And in that moment, even though I cared for the loved one as well, I maintained my balance and I became the anchor for the other person. Okay. And she became able to start to calm down because I held that space. And it, it, it was a very quote unquote, worrisome situation, but we're not going to be able to come up with a productive and healthy solution if we go into the state of worry because it brings fear with it. And fear is a false evaluation about reality. So let's switch we, uh, worry over to progressive concern, understanding that we're here to master energy and emotion. And this is one of our challenges. So I don't like to let worry control me. So I practice the tools, recognizing that sometimes the story, the experience may not have the outcome that we would like, yeah. but that's where we trust. That's where we have faith and we understand that everything happens for a reason. Mm. So these tools, these foundational keys, please, these are not for wussies. These are for the courageous, the brave, the focused, the determined, and the diligent. If you don't really want these tools, you will buy absolutely not be able to practice them. You have to really want it. These are the keys to mastery. Okay? It, it, it sounds like also Challenging. that, you know, even with the first foundational key that only mm -hmm. the ego can be offended in this one as well, the, the um, presence being, you know, taking that breath, this is kind of internally powered. Yeah, yes. You coming have to recognize, from, oh, yes. I'm worried or, oh my, I'm offended. Yes. So it, it really does build upon that presence uh, in the meditation, in your those practices, yes, yes, that helps you with all these keys. I want to use meditation. Um, I want to use working out at the gym, okay, as an example. The first few times that you go to the gym, you're not going to notice a difference. Um, I've been what I call a gym rat for many years of my life, and I noticed that it would take about three weeks before you started to see results. Now, I actually feel that with meditation, you can see results in the first meditation. I, I've seen that. I've experienced it. The gym and meditation are similar. You got to build one on the other. Now, if you keep going to the gym, you get to start to take that buff bod with you wherever you go. The healthy activity that happens in the gym becomes something that you embody every day. Meditation is like that. 
it becomes something that you embody every day. It goes with you wherever you are. Mm. So this is a very, very powerful, powerful foundational tool to meditate. And I, I want to say again, so many people say to me, especially when they start working with me as a coach, meditation is so difficult. I find it really hard. And I say, and what's your point? It is for everybody. You're taking back your control. Yeah. <laughs> You're taking back your power from the monkey mind that just spins. And your monkey mind's been ruling you for a long time. So it's going to take a little bit of practice, just like the gym. You don't go to the gym and expect to have that buff body within three weeks. So manage your expectations and recognize that all of these keys are going to be given plenty of opportunity to practice because life applies lessons for us in every moment of every day. So this becomes something you want to carry with you everywhere that you go. Mm. Okay. So that that transition from worry to progressive concern starts with that yes. breath, starts yes. with that awareness. Yes. From there, we can choose, uh, I'm going to be concerned, and this is the action I'm going to take, yep. and I'm going to release that downward spiral of worry. Yep. And this is where you want to give yourself a pat on the back when, say, for example, uh, an opportunity to worry comes up, and say it takes you 10 minutes, but you were able to switch it from worry to concern. That's awesome. And you'll just get better and better at it. And you'll find that the universe will give you more and more challenging experiences as you become more adept. It doesn't mean you aren't doing it correctly. Okay. For me, there's correct, which leads to alignment and false, which leads to misalignment. This is balance. This is imbalance. This is joy, bliss, happiness. This is suffering to whatever degree on the spectrum. Okay. So you'll get lots and lots of opportunities. Don't worry about it. Mm. It's a practice. We don't arrive overnight. There's another false belief system that says, you know, you're going to flip a switch and arrive overnight. It isn't possible. And some days you're going to absolutely nail it on certain subjects and other days, maybe not. That's okay. That's mm. okay. It doesn't matter how many times you fall down. It's about whether or not you get back up and somebody committed to mastery will get back up. We got a question from Emma Judge here. She says, I worry uh, about every little thing for me. It's the fear of the unknown. Okay. All right. Well, let's switch the unknown from a place of fear to what's next? Because Excited. like attracts like. <laughs> like attracts like. So if you can switch from a place of worry about the unknown and use some faith to recognize that divine grace is with you and that our creative source, divine grace, wants us to be blissfully happy, abundant and joyful mm. and start to switch from I don't know what's coming to more of an anticipatory feeling like it's my birthday. What am I going to get? Now I, I realize this is a bit of a big leap, but it's really, really helpful. Okay, and when we start to take the perspective of the spiritual warrior for light, it starts to become hug your demons before they bite you in the butt. Come on, I know you're coming. The challenges are coming, but I'm up for this. I can do this. I know who I am. I'm internally powered. I've got the tools. I've got the keys and I am focused and practicing them in each moment. So when we switch, remember, like attracts like, when we switch from the perspective that says the unknown is something to worry about to the unknown is something to be excited about because I got this, I can handle this, mm. everything starts to change. Yeah. Cool. Well, this brings us to our fourth foundational key, which is hug your demons before they bite you in the butt. Let's pick a name. You want to pick a name first? So we're going to give away uh, a book. Um a free copy of Mathematical here. Romy? 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 Romy. Romy? Romy. Romy. Congratulations. Good morning, Romy. We will send you a, a free copy of Mathematical. Congratulations. Um, so four uh, is hug your demons before they bite you in the butt. Yeah. So We just touched on that I one. love this one because so to me good. it's like pay your credit card bills now. Yes. Yes. <laughs> pay them off. Right. The sooner you pay them off, the better. So can you explain why this is so important? I have experienced this one to be so valuable because denial is what keeps the demons in the dark and they grow in the dark. So when we live from a fearful, worried perspective, externally driven, we're going to worry. We're going to try to avoid the demons because we don't have the tools. We don't have the awareness to transcend them. And this is understandable. When we start to take on the perspective of I'm going to hug my demons, understanding that these challenges that life sends our way are opportunities. Don't wait until they get to be the big boogeyman in the closet. 
open up the closet, shine the light and say, I got this. Come here. Come on. Let's go. I can handle you. I'm practicing my tools in every moment to the best of my ability. And that's all you have to do. Just to the best of your ability, you will never, none of us will ever completely master them while we're in the physical reality. It's not possible. And then when we return to our natural state, none of this even exists. So hugging our demons is essentially saying, I'm going to accept the next challenge. I'm not afraid. I know that I'm here to master energy and emotion. And in order to do that, I need challenges, AKA demons. So start to embrace the demons and you'll find there's an immediate shift in your perspective. And all of a sudden, those demons going from being, you know, the proverbial big boogeyman to, yeah, I got you. I can handle this. And that in itself shrinks the size of the demon. Mm. So we want to understand uh, the bully nature. OK, when the ego is out of balance. OK, we can become bullies. Now, a bully is always, always going to be coming from the fearful state. The bully needs to power over. And I think you mentioned here one of the experiences I had with a bully. And I've talked about this before, where I came home to my flat and there was a man there who uh, quickly, you know, hell, I won't get into the whole story. Some of you know it. Uh, it, it is in the previous shows. Uh, there was a man that had broken into my my flat and he was there um, watching television drinking beer, uh, which he brought with him. I don't have beer in my home. And uh, he held a knife to my throat. Now, a big knife. A big knife, a gutting knife for fishing. And I will never forget. I'd never seen such a beast in my life. And it was very jagged, very, very scary looking. Okay. And this is where I'm so deeply grateful that I had developed the meditation practice because that buff meditation bod accompanied me to that moment. Now, in order for him to power over in order for him to gain control of me and get what he wanted, he needed me to go into the fearful state in order to feed off of me. Now, I didn't go into fear. I actually, without practice, without warning, remained completely calm, not just on the outside, because you can't fake it, okay? On the inside, I remained calm. And I looked him in the eye and I said, you have no reason to fear me. And in that moment, he had nothing to feed off of because the bully is always in fear. For anybody in abusive situations, the bully is always in fear. And the bully requires a victim to feed off of in order to perpetuate being a bully. If you don't feed the bully because you've remained internally powered, and meditation will gift you this, I promise, then the bully has nothing to feed off of. So this man in that moment, when I said, looking him in the eye, and I had to look up, he was a big guy. I had to look up, up in it and I said, you have no reason to fear me. Now, most of us wouldn't think that I was the one needing to say that. But that was actually the truth. And what happened in that moment was that he collapsed. He dropped the knife and he dropped to his knees and he broke into tears. Okay. Because there was nothing for the bully to feed off of. So whether this is a physical bully standing in front of you or a bully in your head, mm -hmm. which is where most of them are. Okay. These are just thoughts and beliefs in our head that bully us. It can only gain power over you if you go into fear. You become externally driven. You're no longer internally powered. So hug those demons, remembering who and what you really are, and they cannot gain power over you. And then something really beautiful starts to happen. You stop attracting these experiences. Mm -hmm. People just start to get the vibe. Like I know myself, people will say to me, I'm just on my best behavior when I'm with you, Lynette. And why is that? Not because I'm walking around acting like some lord and master, but because I'm internally powered. They can't gain power over me. And a bully will unconsciously know that, that they can't gain power of you. Some bullies will consciously know that. And we've got some bullies that are trying to run the planet right now. And we need to understand that the only way that they can do that, the only way that they can get away with this agenda is if we give them our power. When we remain internally powered, we are sovereign beings. We're unstoppable. Mm. We're omnipotent. When you're stuck in fear, though, when you have a demon that is you're trying to hug, but you're still in that fearful mm -hmm. state, how mm -hmm. do you, before you can even hug them, you got to let go of that fear. Well, right? and sometimes letting go of that fear is not just like something you can do in one fell swoop. We right. might need to do it a breath at a time. Okay, again, I want to apply tools, baby steps, and you can't climb a ladder from the top rung first. I myself remember having experiences before I came to this level of mastery where fear was incredible. 
okay? And in those moments, sometimes just a baby breath, and you might even want to comfort yourself. Sometimes, you know, we're in incredibly shocking and fearful experiences. Start to comfort yourself. Mm. Breathe. Bring the power back in and practice. B-A-A-A. Breathe. Accept. Allow. Ask for help. Now, we want to breathe because that immediately brings the light of spirit. Each breath that you take is keeping you alive. It is a gift from the divine source. Then when we accept what's happening, we don't form that first layer of resistance, which is actually going to perpetuate the problem. Okay? We accept it and we allow it. Not that we're going to allow an abusive situation. There will be certain circumstances where you need to take action. Okay? So please understand. Use your discretion. Use common sense. But we allow it from the perspective of not creating resistance in our mind. Okay, because that's going to immediately polarize us. And we can do this, breathe, accept, allow in a nanosecond, and then ask for help. Divine grace, guide me now, be with me now. Okay, and I have to say from my own personal perspective, from my own experience, this is a powerful, powerful tool and divine grace will come. I will also encourage in, in deeply traumatic states, fearful states, to start to repeat only the light may enter. Only the light may enter. And when you remember who and what you are, so does everything around you. It must. The universe is essentially built and coded to obey the divine immortal, which is what we are. We're divine immortal beings having a human experience. When we remember who we are and we invoke our sovereign power by making intentional statements like only the light may enter, that will immediately begin to diffuse the power of our external or internal demons. Powerful, powerful tool. The main step is to remember to apply this tool when you're in that fearful state. Mm -hmm. And this is why I encourage becoming comfortable with these concepts, with these keys, memorize them, become very familiar with them and watch. Just like the buff bod accompanies you everywhere you go. Once you get practiced enough at working out at the gym, these tools will also start to jump into your mind and you'll begin to practice them. And I know you, Graham, you've practiced some of these tools, like only the light may enter. Yep. Yeah. And it is it is a focusing and, it, and it's a full, you have to fully embrace it. It's not a, a thing you just say in your head. It's an energetic thing you have to get into you. Um, yes. That, that from that place, it's like you're fully aligned in that, that frequency or that vibration of that statement. Yes. And you embody it as opposed to just, you know, saying it in your head, but, you know, deep down, you're like, I don't believe it. You know, it's, it's right. And, and we may not believe in. it at first, but remember, like attracts like. And the more you practice this. So I have had the great honor and privilege of watching Graham grow so much. Oh, thank you. So much very inspiring. And for everybody that I watch and witness growing, you guys feed me, you guys are inspiring me. And I have had moments where I, you know, experiencing with Graham, his growth, his ability to stand in his power, which is what is allowing Graham to be a light for the rest of us now. This is what we become when we master these tools. We become the light and the way because we be it. And it begins with a baby step. And before you know it, You'll be climbing mountains and taking on demons that you never believed were was possible. Mm. I've witnessed it. This guy right here. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank yourself. You did it. You practiced the tools. So uh, our fifth one, this is probably the last one we'll do, and then we'll jump to questions because um, we got a lot of questions from you guys we want to get to too. But uh, mm -hmm. we're going to do the last, the last one for this episode of Reflections on the Journey. This is the fifth key in Foundational Keys, Chapter 14 of Math and Magical. And Lynette, you just start out this key by saying, wakey, wakey, shaky, shaky. Yep. It's not doom and gloom time. <laughs> it's rise and shine time. Okay. And I want to come back to saying, why did we call these foundational keys? Because Graham and I had a discussion about this. And I wanted to call it foundational keys because I would say these were the first set of keys that you want to work on. These are the ones that can frame the picture, so to speak, for going forward. And when you embrace these foundational keys, everything gets easier a lot faster. So wakey, wakey, shaky, shaky. It's not doom and gloom time. It's rise and shine time. We need to awaken to who and what we really are in order to overcome the challenges that we are currently facing at a global level. This is the great awakening, ladies and gentlemen. This is the great awakening. Wake up and recognize this. Don't play stupid, it's beneath you. Remember who and what you are. 
Embrace those demons. Step up as the spiritual warrior for light that you really are, embracing your personal sovereignty. You are the captain of your own ship. And when we recognize that we're here to master energy and emotion, we wake up to that truth. We're no longer asleep. We can no longer be led. Like, what is that expression? Sheeple. To mm. just blindly follow. This is not how we're intended to be. We're intended to be internally powered from the same source. But from the internally powered perspective, we are divinely inspired. We will be guided. We will be protected. But we have to choose of our own free will. And that's one of the conditions here in the classroom of Earth. We have free will. You have the choice to awaken or not. And if you're in a great state of suffering, then it is your call to awaken. Because you and you alone are the only one that can set yourself free from this state of suffering. So anybody out there who's experiencing pain and suffering to whatever degree, wake up, mm. remember who you are, even if only a breath at a time, ask for the help. And I promise, I promise if you ask with sincerity, if you're asking with truth in your heart, it will come mm. every single time. I promise. Wakey, wakey. It is not doom and gloom time. I realize we're facing challenges, but I am not afraid. I'm up for it. Graham and I were saying the other day, we'd heard some challenging news that we weren't in fear, that we were inspired to move towards the light even more. How did you say it? What was I it? said, I smell victory and I'm ready for this spiritual war. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Okay. So we got some questions here from supporters. So these questions have been submitted on the mathematical.com website. Uh, if you do have questions about our next chapter, magical keys, you can go on mathematical.com, scroll to the bottom and enter your question there. Mm -hmm. So from India, she says, do you believe in reincarnation? I am focused on the theme. I am living moments that I think are not from this life. Is that possible? Thank you. Now, I remember this question was actually directed at Graham. And I think it's most appropriate uh, for me to answer the question. Um, whether Graham believes in reincarnation or not is not actually relevant. It's whether you do or not. Okay. And I'm not going to push anyone to embrace a thought, a belief, or anything that they're not ready to embrace. But let's challenge with common sense for a moment the concept that says we only live one lifetime. Well, if we only live one lifetime, then this, this experience is incredibly unfair. If we start to look at it from the perspective that we live many lifetimes, not in the same body, not with the same story or name, okay? If somebody was to say to me, Lynette, who are you? Or they were to say to me, who are you? I would say, I'm a divine immortal having a human experience. And the way that they address me is with the name Lynette, okay? So we live many lifetimes, each lifetime offering us an opportunity to master the keys farther and farther and farther. And right now on earth, there are many of us that are beginning to remember our previous embodiments, okay? So I like to use the, the uh, metaphor of a book. A book has got many, many chapters. It's the same book and each chapter can be talking about different things and it can be about different characters, but it's the same book, okay? So we are the same spirit within that re-embodies into subsequent lifetimes, taking our mastery with us. Mm. This is also how you can explain, for example, children who have extraordinary abilities. Like I remember discussing metaphysics with my grandmother when I was a young child. And for me, that was normal, but it certainly isn't normal for most of us. And why was I able to do that? Because I remembered from a previous embodiment. Please remember, you cannot unknow what you know. Any of the keys that you master become yours forever. Also, please remember, you don't know what you don't know until you know what you know. We are constantly learning. We are constantly expanding. We will never arrive. This very humbling truth can set us free from a lot of challenges. So we do live many lifetimes. I accept and understand that some people may not see it from that perspective yet, and, and that is completely fine, no problem. But from my perspective, there is no question. I have full cognizant memory of previous embodiments. I've traveled around the world, and I've traveled to places where I had never been before in this physical container that I call Lynette, or that my mother called Lynette. Uh, however, I knew my way around the place. I knew my way around the building. I had visceral memories download into my body about experiences I had in that particular space in previous embodiments, okay? One of my last ones was visiting Hadrian's Wall. 
And when I, when I was standing on the land of Hadrian's Wall, I had flashes of battles in a previous time on Earth. And the very mm. clear knowing, not a thought, not a belief, it was a knowing that said I had died and bled on that land. I knew. I just knew I'd been there before. It was very, very emotional for me as I was essentially doing what I call, this is getting much deeper here just for a moment, tripping a timeline. And I was in this physical body, stepping in a place where my previous spirit in another physical body had actually been. So this is what I call tripping timelines, okay? This also speaks to deja vu. We'll talk about that in another mm. time. Deep stuff, I love it. Yeah. Um, I so want we're to talk given more many about chances, that, <laughs> we're given many chances, yeah. many opportunities. Don't worry, you're gonna keep coming back till you master this. Mastery is waking up, remembering who you are, becoming internally powered, powered through divine source that unites us all. I had a vision once, uh, India, um, where I saw these different faces and they were all connected to this eye and they all went back like this, kind of like, you know, when, when you look at two mirrors and you can see that infinite sort of reflection. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I had this moment of seeing all these faces and they were all yeah. connected to this, this eye. Yeah. Men, women, through different ages. And I had this feeling like, oh, those are previous people that I have been. Um, Those so, are previous personalities. Personalities, yeah. Right, and we want to remember that you can come back as a man or a woman, a male or a female, okay? You, you will also travel in soul groups. This is how we have, you know, encounters with people that we just know. I just, I, I know I haven't met you physically in this lifetime, but I just know you. So this is also a great comfort for those of us who've lost ones in the physical that are no longer here. Trust me, you're going to come back. You travel in soul groups. They may not be in the same physical body, but you're going to know them at spirit level. That's that deja vu. That's that connection. Mm. Okay, soul groups, soulmates, twin flames. Lori says, in foundational keys, you touch on various things. I have a question on when you are tackling, hugging your demons and waking up parts of you, waking up parts of your journey to face past traumas, don't you need to use 50, 50 head and heart until you have overcome them? So you do, so you do not get too attached to emotions, events that can be overwhelming and painful. Okay. So that's kind of a two part question. Can you read the first part for me again? I, I just want to make sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you are tackling hug your demons and wake up parts of mm -hmm. your journey to face past traumas, don't you need to use 50, 50 head and heart until you've overcome them? Okay. So I want to clarify, uh, in the terms of the book. Thank you, Laurie. Good question. Um, head is the math heart is the master. So yes, in a sense, we are the magic. Sorry. Yeah. Head is the math. The heart is the master. It's the magic. Thank you. What we want to essentially understand is that when we are challenging things, we want to come powered from the heart. This is our power. This is our guidance, intuition, okay? Connection to the infinite. We then will use the master to give instructions to the servant. So technically, yes, your heart would say something like, I'm not going to react in this moment and attack this person who's shouting at me. And then the mind will say, I'm going to do what the heart has instructed me to do. I'm not going to react. I'm now going to move myself from the physical space or something like that. So technically, yes, you are using both the master and the servant. But please understand, the master must always be doing the driving. The master is the one to be in charge if we are going to become sovereign beings. Okay, so there will be points where the master is doing all of the driving exclusively and you may not be engaging the mind. For example, in transcendental meditation, this is where we quiet the servant. And we give the servant the time off while we go deeply into the heart. So there will be times where you're using both. But at all times, the name of the game to be internally powered, to be a sovereign being means the heart is the master. The heart will always be present. The heart will always be steering the ship there will be times when the servant is given instructions. The mess starts to get, you know, it, it starts to get messy when the servant is doing the driving. Hmm. That's when we start to encounter problems. So the master gives the instructions to the head, the head carries out the instructions from the master's perspective. If the head is both master and servant, we're gonna run into problems. 
Okay, it's really helpful to understand that the logical mind is connected to the ego, the physicality. Okay, it's also masculine energy. And the logical mind is only capable of regurgitating what it's been programmed to do, much like a computer. So if you want inspiration, if you want common sense, if you want divine connection, then you must be internally powered and coming from the inspiritus, inspired state of the heart. Okay, I hope that does that. Well, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, it's amazing. There's so much there. And then you can go, I know you can go further and further. I hope that answers your question, Lori. Um, and she also had that you said there's a kind of a second part to it. Um, so not getting too attached to emotions, events that can be overwhelming and painful. Right. So emotions, the way I describe emotions and feelings, and I've said this before, I'll say it again, feelings, we can be feeling something intuitively being guided and being given some very, very challenging information. When it's received through the heart, however, we're able to remain in a balanced state, even in, in alignment, even if we're being given really challenging information. I'll use an example. Um, I was given the intuitive information about my mother's death over a decade before she was to pass. Now, if I went into emotion, that would be my feelings going into chaos. Okay, so I remained in the feeling state because I allowed my heart to continue to be the master. And then I gave the servant the instructions. Okay, so when we remain internally powered, we can receive challenging information through the intuitive connection, through, okay, spirit, and not become emotional. If we're becoming emotional, it means we're experiencing it from the ego state. And that's okay. But that's where we apply our tools and mastery so that we don't go on that emotional roller coaster, which drains us and mm. depletes the body. And eventually, over time, if we keep riding that roller coaster, okay, it releases cortisol and starts to cause dis ease in the body. So you can experience very, very challenging things. Remaining in the balanced state, you can feel what's happening. This does not mean you disconnect, you become a, a heart, hard, cold, heartless person. Not at all. It means that you can transcend incredibly challenged experiences and remain in the heart. Mm. Okay. Mm. Can we can we jump back to the reincarnation question? <laughs> pick another name. Um, let's let's pick another name here. Can we pick two names? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, I want to jump back to the reincarnation question because um, we got Cindy judge here she wrote a comment she says i don't want to come back and do this all again <laughs> <laughs> then master it then master it but however when we start to master the game okay we start to get to experience life the way it was really intended for us it's a beautiful delicious journey and i myself have wrestled so much with being here because the sensitivities i have mean i can't turn it off I feel the pain and the discomfort of people all around me. I feel the collective because I'm an adept empath. I understand it can be challenging. But at the same time, when we start to master the game and we know how to use the tools, it starts to get really delicious and fun. Mm. And we do want to come back. Okay, This was designed to be the proverbial Garden of Eden. And we've fallen asleep and we've forgotten this. So wakey, wakey, shaky, shaky, take back your power. Step into the sovereign state, step at a time, breath at a time, and watch if you don't start to really enjoy this experience. And mm -hmm. maybe you want to come back, remembering you get to come back with any of the knowing that you have mastered. You can't unknow what you know. It becomes yours forever. The work that I do humbles me. And I am so deeply, deeply grateful that I get to do this because I witness people becoming masters. And as more of us are becoming the master of the game, we are essentially taking back our power from the shadow, from the bullies, from the fear. So for those of you who've asked me questions about what's going on in humanity right now, okay, what's happening on the planet, the, the pandemic, shall we call it, okay, the answer is step into your power and watch humanity rise like the phoenix from the ashes. The truth of who and what we are is being revealed. The challenge is our opportunity. Step into your power and you're gonna to wanna to come back and you will come back as a guide, as a master, as a teacher. Patty Anderson, congratulations. Patty. Patty Anderson, Sally will send you a free copy of Mathemagical. And we also have Debbie, uh, how do, you, do you know how to say that? And Namsari? 
Gam Gamsuri Gamsuri Debbie Gamsuri Debbie sounds Gamsuri. sounds like a Gaelic name to me a little bit G H A M. Well, anyways, Sally will email you a copy. Congratulations, Debbie and Patty. Okay, wonderful. Okay. Next question. Next question we got is from Carol. She says, "How is it possible to balance my need to be a rescuer, which she is comfortable with, with my own need to have a rescuer, which she is not so comfortable with, as this catapults me back into victim mode?" And I don't want to go there again. I recognize the need to be in balance with both these aspects of myself, but how to get there? In the balanced state, there is neither victim nor rescuer. Back to remembering that we're designed to be sovereign beings. We're designed to be the captain of our own ship. So I don't personally buy into rescuing, saving, or helping people. I do, however, highly endorse being of support and service to one another on this incredibly challenging journey to mastery. So when we let go of victimhood within ourselves, we will no longer feel the need to rescue people or people please or overfunction is another way to say it. And it's helpful to look at it from the caretaker, caregiver perspective. Mm. If we buy into victim and rescuer, we're going to be caretakers. We will essentially be draining ourselves to take care of other people. And this is why what I call kindnesses with no truth, who haven't recognized their sovereign power, can get drained. We become depleted and we often become resentful or we shut down believing that the world is just a cold, hard place. Instead of res recognizing, excuse me, instead of recognizing that we've bought into victimhood. Now, if you buy into victimhood, you're going to need somebody to rescue you. But if you're not buying into victimhood, you're now tuning into sovereignty, which says everything happens for a reason. I can support and serve you on this journey, but I can't take this journey for you. And I'm not going to take yeah. from myself in order to take care of you where you ought to be taking care of yourself. If we move into caregiver, which is oxygen mask on self first. The fastest path to enlightenment is loving self-care. We then start to come from the sovereign place of balance, which means I don't see victims. I, I don't see victims. I see people with opportunities. And if we see somebody as a victim, then we're automatically also buying into pity, which creates mm -hmm. separation. Mm -hmm. If we start to look at it from the perspective of caregiving, I will give care where and when I can. Now, I am a caregiver. Uh, it's, it's, it's how I live. It, it was a calling that I came to answer. And if I did not master, and this is true for people who are starting to become aware that they're empathic. Okay. We're all empathic. It's just a question of how much awareness you have around it. Empaths will drain themselves very quickly if we are caretakers. So we're people pleasers, believing in victim mentality. We're going to be out of balance. We're going to drain ourselves. We're going to burn out. If we shift to becoming caregivers, first to ourselves, and a lot of people have been taught that that's selfish, that's a lie, it's a false belief system. If we give care to ourselves first, we then come from a sustainable place to continue to give care to the other person while they face the challenges that we all must inevitably face. Mm. So neither a victim nor a rescuer be. Let's step into our sovereign power and recognize we're all given challenges. There's no mistakes, there's no accidents. Okay, everything is calculated with mathematical precision. So if somebody is facing an incredible challenge and you start to think, oh, poor them or oh, poor me, you're already down the wrong path if you're looking for alignment. You're going to want to turn that around, hug your demons, embrace them and say, where's the key? Where's the tool? Divine, guide me now and watch. You'll step into your power and you won't feed the victim mentality. You will stop drawing people around you who want to be rescued. People are very respectful of my time, even people that I have in my inner circle. And I also want to be very respectful of their time. I'm going to check in with someone. If I'm asking them to hold space for me to be of service and support, I'll check in with them. For example, Graham has been tremendously supportive and has served the light in so many ways in supporting me. He doesn't take care of me. He doesn't overfunction but he will serve and support where he can, when he can, without draining himself. So that requires that I be respectful of his boundaries. So the answer here is also boundaries, healthy, helpful boundaries that are sustainable because they can grow and evolve. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we need to pull on our boundaries a little bit more. Sometimes we can open them up depending on the person and the situation. I hope that answers your question, Carol. Kathy says, how do you determine the difference between surrendering to life's flow versus the suppression of your feelings? Is meditation the best way to get to this place? I absolutely love the way 
I've been awakened to all these different lessons. Thank you so much. And what was the lady's name? Kathy. Kathy. Okay, Kathy. So the difference between surrendering and giving in is what I'm hearing. Okay. Giving in comes from a disempowered state from that of victimhood and says, I don't have solutions. There's nothing I can do. And our ego at that point, remember, will step in and deny, deflect or distort because it believes it has no power. So it's just going to kind of sweep it under the rug. Okay. This is not surrendering. Surrendering says, I accept again, bah, breathe, accept, allow, ask for help. I accept what's happening. I don't have to like it. I don't have to want it. Or even condone it. Or even condone it. Yeah. Okay. This also steps into forgiveness, which is one of the further keys down the road, but I do accept it. And at that moment, you may want to immediately step into asking for guidance and support, tune in and ask for it. And I, I ask all the time. Okay. I simply could not survive this reality without that connection and nor would I. Okay. So surrendering means I accept life on its terms. I accept this challenge. I'm going to embrace this demon. I may not have figured it out all at once. And typically we don't, but I do have the tools to take the next step. And in the surrendering, we are being really grown up. Okay. We're not resisting and surrendering can Oh, wow. Surrendering will completely change the game. Okay. And I'm not being flippant again. I don't want to be disrespectful in any way to people's experiences. Uh, I'll use a quick example myself. My son was nine months old and he was in the hospital. Um, and I was told that he had spinal meningitis and I had 24 hours left to enjoy him, that he was basically going to be dead within 24 hours. In that moment, I could have gone into denial I would have created polarization. I would have gone out into imbalance and I couldn't have accessed the solution from that point. Instead, from an incredibly powerful place within me through the connection, I accepted those terms. And let me tell you, I love my children so very deeply. They are my raison d'être. And accepting that my son was perhaps only going to have 24 hours left to live was one of the most challenging things I've ever had to accept. But through that acceptance, I was given the grace to become a facilitator for his healing. And he's going to be 29 on May 12th. Mm. So no matter what the challenge is in front of you, surrender is the only way out. It will ask you to step into your sovereignty one baby step at a time, but it is the only way out. Mm. Denial will suppress. You'll see the problem perpetuate. Surrendering opens the doors to the solution immediately. Okay, I hope that helps. Easier said than done sometimes. Easier said than done. Again, practice, practice, practice. Fidelity, focus, discipline. Mm -hmm. Life isn't something that happens on special occasions. Life is something that's happening live in every moment. And we are being given opportunities to overcome challenges, problems, whatever you want to call them. I like to see them as opportunities because that's really what they are. They're opportunities for me to master further and further, who and what I really am, which is a sovereign being connected to divine spirit, who is therefore capable of overcoming and integrating anything that comes my way. Carol says, awakening to who and what we really are is truly amazing. Mm -hmm. It is also, it is also scary and definitely yep. outside of my comfort zone. Yep. I, she says, I am finding myself frustrated by watching those I love who are unable or unwilling to understand despite seeing obvious changes in me. She asks, how are you able to cope with watching those who are still asleep? I'm not sure it's possible to teach this way of being. It comes through direct revelation. What do you think and how do you cope? The two things that I would encourage here are number one, acceptance with respect and boundaries. Not everybody is ready and willing yet. And that is a part of the great divide that we're going through. Right now, we're seeing a divide between those of us that are ready and willing to wakey-wakey and those of us that aren't. And to resist the, the fact that somebody may not be ready or willing yet is actually arrogant and disrespectful. The challenge then comes for the master to accept and allow for the fact that their loved ones may not understand. And this is something that I can speak to with a great deal of personal experience. I've had to let go of most people in my life, including my first family, because they could not accept or understand what I was actually about. I don't encourage trying to teach. Lead through attraction, not promotion. I don't promote myself. You will not see any advertisements. I attract. So those that are ready to embrace will be attracted to us. 
those that are not will resist us. And it's imperative that we respect this or we will create further polarization and separation. We will each awaken in our own time, in our own way. And the fastest path to enlightenment, both for ourselves and to serve and support those around us on the path, is to expect, or sorry, to accept with deep respect that we're all doing this in our own time and that if we model it, those that are ready will be attracted to us. Hmm. Tammy asks, um, you say that false belief systems are the biggest trap traps of all, which she wholeheartedly agrees with. Her question is, how do we change or fix those false belief systems when we cannot pinpoint where they come from? You don't need to pinpoint where they come from, okay? You don't. All you need to do is be present in the moment now. And if you're meant to learn where they came from, then you will. That will be revealed to you. But the opportunity isn't in figuring out where the belief system comes from. The whys don't matter. The why it's there isn't relevant. The fact is, is that the universe creates a, a classroom here for us to present these challenges so that we can overcome them. The key is to recognize that you're this moment now, now is all we have. Don't worry. These false belief systems will present themselves to you in your story in the form of a challenge, a problem, or what I like to call opportunity. Don't worry about where they came from. If you're meant to know, you will come to know, typically on the other side of overcoming the challenge. So putting our attention on the mm. moment now, recognizing I've got a false belief system in front of me. How do I know? Because it's creating a contracted state of my body. I'm feeling tense. It's creating separation. I'm starting to go out of balance. How do I know? Because I'm feeling crappier and crappier and crappier. Mm -hmm. The crappier you feel, the bigger the belief system that you're holding on to. So the solution is in being present in this moment right now and recognizing the whys don't matter. It's not what happens to you that matters. It's what you do with it. Okay, mm -hmm. our universal creator has such a great sense of humor. We're not typically given the answers to the test until we overcome it. And I don't even like to say that we're tested because we aren't. The universe, our creative source, ourselves in our higher state of consciousness know that we can overcome anything. The only part of us that really needs to become aware that we can overcome anything is the ego state. And that's the one that can forget. That's the one that can create separation. And that is the one that we overcome in this moment now, 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 now. And it will present itself as the challenge in the moment. You overcome the challenge in this moment now to whatever degree that you're capable of. And you'll find the next moment will just automatically follow. And before you know it, you'll see the whole story. Mm. What clicked for me and when you just shared that was how often in my own life, I relate to this question where I would try and figure out what, what, why, why I believe this or where it came from yeah. before doing the work because it, it, it allowed me to not face what right. I to and face. this is one of and, the ego's traps. Yeah, it's, it's Such a, a good point. It's a great Thank trap. you. I fall into that it's often. a great <laughs> trap. So what the ego does is it gets us distracted. Where did this come and from? And looking for the happen? why yeah. instead of getting on with it. So it's yeah. kind of like uh, you know your house is on fire. And instead of working on putting it out and getting, you know, the hose out, you're trying to figure out what caused the fire. We'll take care of that later. We'll figure out what caused the fire later. In the meantime, put the fire out. I now. like that metaphor. That's good. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Well, guys, uh, we're just going to wrap up the show here. Uh, Lynette wants to give away another. She's oh, throwing it out. Oh, look it at that. Oh, this is a special lucky one. Kathy Han Hansley. Katie, Katie, sorry, Katie, Katie Hansley. Hansley. Katie Hansley, you were really excited to win this because your name just jumped out of the hat. So Sally will send you so a copy of Mathematics. Before we go, I'd like to touch on a little bit of what's happening on the planet right now. Okay. Okay. And I want to incorporate some of these tools here. We want to understand that it's always darkest before the dawn. And right now we are in what appears to be a dark time. If you look at it from the fearful state of the ego. Now, if you're looking at it from the perspective that both Graham and I share, because we're both inspired and connected, we see it as a time of opportunity. We see it as a time to master our tools and step into the light. And as we master the tools and step into the light, we are literally setting ourselves free from shadow. Please remember, evil, shadow, fear, all of these states of suffering are only the absence of light. Remember that you are the light now, 
now, now, and watch the shadow collapse, just like the guy who held the knife to my throat fell to his knees and started to cry. The fear can only perpetuate, it can only continue if you remain ignorant and unaware of who and what you are. Remember who you are. Practice meditation. Remember that it's darkest before the dawn and that we all grow outside of our comfort zone. So please remember, when you're feeling vulnerable, it is simply your ego saying, I'm out of my comfort zone. Nobody grows inside the box. Nobody grows inside their comfort zone. So hug your demons. Embrace the fact that the shadow is being revealed. You could say the enemy is revealing and exposing itself. Embrace the tools. Step forward. Bring the light. Be the light. And set us free. Please do not underestimate the power of one being. The minute you start to think, I myself, I can't make a difference. Oh, you're definitely out of alignment. Mm -hmm. Please remember that when you embody the light, you become the light when the shadow is trying to overtake us. Even in tiny, tiny, small ways. When you're walking down the street, send out a smile. Lift it up. Smile. When you're walking into a challenging situation, work at holding that balanced perspective and watch as the people around you become more and more attracted to you as you model the way to be the light. I am the light. I am the way. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, we have some kind words. Do we want to share some kind words with Always. you? Always. <laughs> oh, we have some music, too. We've also got music to share with you guys. Lynette, uh, well, last our last episode, uh, someone recommended or suggested that we uh, put the playlist in the description of this video. Yes. So Lynette has got some more music. Lynette's always got great music. So she's going to create another playlist, and we'll put it in the description of this video. Uh, she was playing some songs for me earlier here. So that will be in the description maybe in the next 15, 20 minutes. Yep. Uh, and I... I want to also um, share one of uh, one of the other people that I'm working with is Brett Kissel, and he's got a new album out with a song called Kindness. Mm -hmm. And I want to encourage people to play that song and listen to the album. Uh, we're, we both know Brett. Wonderful yeah. piece of work. Share the light. Share the work. And another uh, couple of songs that I'm going to share are from uh, a, a songwriter, a singer-songwriter called Lauren Daigle, yeah. which was shared with me by Stacy. Thank you so much, Stacy. I really appreciate that. So for anybody who's got inspiring music, please send us the links. Music is a fantastic tool. Please remember the keys to the kingdom are vibratory. We are vibratory beings. So if you want to raise your frequency, if you want to essentially give yourself one of the antidotes to fear, surround yourself with a powerful playlist that inspires you and watch. Sometimes I've experienced so great a challenge that I will just sit there and play inspiring music over and over and over again. And I literally, literally feel like I'm being lifted. I'm being lifted by the vibration of that inspiring music. Yep. So share music with each other, share the inspiring stuff and watch what happens. So Cynthia says, uh, hello, and I want to thank you on the, for the video on traps, which was our previous episode of Reflections on the Journey. She, say, she said, I needed it at the moment as we had an incident with my parents, both 88, and my brother was not being able to get in touch with them. My mom has dementia, and my dad is the main caretaker. So we were concerned something bad might have happened, and she was taken to the hospital again. Since I live in a town, I went to the house to find it black so went in just to make sure everything was okay they were not home car was gone and cell phone was sitting on the counter we started calling family and friends and just found out they were at a friend's house i was able to remain calm during all of this and i just kept hearing in my head breathe oh thank you what an amazing story because if you had allowed your ego to take over and you didn't practice breathing and again that's the most powerful tool if you hadn't done that you would have gone into worry and you could have actually perpetuated, created a really negative outcome instead of going, whoops, things happen. Now, this is a real practicer of mastery because these challenging situations will present themselves all the time. Okay. And remaining present in the unknown, in limbo. Woo. <laughs> High five, girl. High five. Keep on doing it. Definitely bring in the light. Yep. And remember that experience next time. Shirley says, Graham and Lynette, I love to accompany you in the Reflections on the Journey show, and I can say that I feel like someone else. I was always very busy with no time for me. Today, I'm learning to be more calm and to take baby steps. A lot of gratitude for you two. Listening to you both brings peace to my heart. Thank you. 
Great awesome. story. Remember, the fastest path to enlightenment is loving self-care. And our society and culture has taught us that if we put ourselves first, we're selfish, self-centered. Mm -hmm. I'd like to put a little spin on that word because we are word made flesh. When we are centered in self, we can go on and on and on. We can continue through every and any challenge that presents itself. So please practice loving self-care so that you may give care and not take care and burn out. Thank you so much for your breakthroughs. Please share them with us and share them with each other. At themagical.com, you can scroll to the bottom. There's a section for breakthroughs. You can share them with us and we'll share um, them on the show. Uh, next episode is Magical Keys. We have three groups of keys. Today was foundational. Next episode will be Magical. And then the final is Master. So Master please keys. practice these foundational keys and share your breakthroughs with us because again, you know, as soon as we decide to align ourselves with the truth of who and what we are, you will begin to see immediate relief, sometimes greatly, sometimes slowly, but you will begin to see immediate relief. And it's imperative that we share these breakthroughs with each other, that we share this mastery path with each other. As Rumi said, one of my favorites, we're all just walking each other home. Thank you so much for joining us. See you next time. Thanks, guys. Okay.